Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you very warmly to today's session. Uh, these are part of the UN Decade Virtual Series. And uh, the topic we'll be tackling is how to empower women to participate fully in the Ocean Decade. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Oku. I work at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute as a senior research officer. And I also lead uh, the region through the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association, which is an association of marine scientists in the Western Indian Ocean region as their president. I'd like to welcome you very warmly uh, to this session and look forward uh, to engaging with a wide a variety, uh, wide panel of experts who will be talking into this uh, exciting topic. Welcome. Listed here are the is the list of experts who will be joining us today. We have Dr. Ariel Trosi the chair of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, myself moderating the session. We have uh, Dr. Ala Jobran from Sweden, Ms. Jean Ansher from Nigeria, Ms. Mara Frelich uh, representing uh, the Society for Women in Marine Science, Dr. Genevieve uh, Borchard, uh, from Canada, uh, represent a hydrographer from Canada, the hydrographer general, in fact, Professor Rohan Long, uh, the director of the World Maritime University, Dr. Sushala Apple Shabanich, uh, all the way from Thailand, and uh, finally, Dr. Kurt Nisens, who uh, is a program specialist uh, at IOC UNESCO. We'll be leading uh, uh, you through the session uh, where our panelists will be giving us brief interventions. As we move forward, we will launch a poll which we invite you to um, put in your comments and then I'll be reading the poll result as we move forward. Thank you. It's a very simple poll. We are asking you, what is your gender? I would like to know um, who has joined us and the gender uh, alignment of our participants today. So do take some time to fill it in so that we may understand who we are speaking to. As we wait for the poll results, I'd like to encourage each one of you uh, to engage with us through a question and answer session. Please type uh, your questions in the question and answer box. Do not put them in the chat box. We would be uh, excited to engage with you. And as you put your questions, type in your name and organization, and also the panelists that you would like to respond to your question. So that's just guidance. I can see the poll results are in. And uh, this uh, day we are joined by 209 uh, females and 19 male participants. That makes 91% uh, of our participants today are women and 9% uh, are men. Uh, I welcome the men to this engagement because I do believe uh, it is important that we come together 
and um, that it is important for us to come together to engage on this important discussion and to understand how best to um, empower women to engage. So we'll move forward. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for filling in our poll for us. Uh, we move forward and I'd like to invite uh, Captain Ariel Trossi, the chairperson of IOC UNESCO, to give us some introductory remarks. Uh, Ariel holds a degree in physical oceanography. He has worked uh, with the Argentine Navy as an oceanographer, and he has a long standing and proactive engagement and involvement in marine scientific research project management and associated services, as well as long-term service with the IOC of UNESCO. Welcome, Ariel. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, of course, on, on behalf of IOC, I would like to welcome you all to this session of the Ocean Decade virtual series on empowering women in the Ocean Decade. And we have organized this in partnerships with, with our friends from the Canadian Commission for our UNESCO and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Uh, it's really great to see so many participants today. Uh, but thinking back, uh, uh, I would like to point out that back in 1945, the UN Charter reaffirmed the faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person and in the equal rights of men and women. A few years later, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights stated that everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and without any discrimination, has the right to equal pay for equal work. Gender equality is a human rights principle, a precondition for sustainable people-centered development, and it's a goal in and of itself. It implies that the interests, needs, and priorities of both women and men are taking into consideration, recognizing the diversity of different groups. And yet, more than 70 years later, we find ourselves here to address empowerment of women in the ocean decade. The Global Ocean Science Report, the first edition published in 2017, reported that there's more equal gender balance in ocean science than in science overall. The results of the survey indicates that female scientists comprise on average 38% of the researchers in ocean science, which is about 10% higher than the global share of female researchers. But still women are underrepresented in many categories of ocean science. On the other hand, the results on other ocean related activities such as fisheries, labor at sea, policy making and management are far less encouraging. What is clear? is that we need to do more, we need to do better, and we need to do different to overcome existing limitations and barriers in terms of gender. We are barely 50 days away from the beginning of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, a decade of all and for all of us. It is a unique opportunity to think differently, to push the boundaries towards a paradigm shift under the true spirit of inclusivity equity and diversity of the decade and act accordingly, enhancing opportunities for women and girls, redressing gender imbalance at all levels, from school to higher education and professional development, increasing the attractiveness and accessibility of ocean related professions to girls and women, including by providing the right skills and increasing awareness of the opportunities that exist. We are going beyond co-design science. We are co-designing our common future. We are on the right track to ensure that by 2030, women as much as men are driving ocean science, observations and management, driving a sustainable ocean economy and helping to deliver the ocean we need for the future we want. I am very much looking forward to listening and engaging with such a distinguished and brilliant panel as the one we have here today with us. And with that, thank you very much to everyone and back to you, Jacqueline. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chirossi. Still exciting to be here and exciting to host each one of you. 
I will move to uh, giving some highlights uh, of the Global Ocean Science Report that has been highlighted. So we go to the next slide. And uh, one of the interesting things I found is that SDG 14 is silent on gender. Um, so we have to look at SDG 5 to look at aspects of gender equality and how women can participate in uh, SDG 14 on life below water. We know women play a critical role in ocean science, fisheries, conservation. And uh, it is important that uh, we go beyond SDG 14 to find out what really we can do to engage even more. So what I'll be sharing are some of the statistics from the Global Ocean Science Report for which I'm a core uh, chair on the editorial team. So next slide. We found uh, that gender equality in ocean science is not yet there. We still have some distance to go. And uh, when we mapped the countries, we found that uh, ocean science personnel range from 7% in DRC Congo to 72% in Ireland. And this is of all the ocean science personnel, that's the percentage uh, of women that engage in ocean science. The percentage of female, uh, females in ocean science is equal or higher than 50% in countries like Angola, Bulgaria, Croatia, El Salvador, again, Ireland, Poland, and Turkey. So they're countries that are excelling in uh, having women engage in this very unique area and this beautiful area of science. Next slide. The interesting thing that we found in the Global Ocean Science Report 2020 from the statistics gathered from member countries is that uh, there is more equal gender balance in ocean science than in science overall. So what that means is that uh, there are more female scientists in ocean science, they comprise 39% of all the researchers. So women are engaging more uh, in ocean science than they do in the other sciences. Next slide. This slide shows uh, the various responses from countries. And again, uh, it still re uh, reinforces what I've said uh, previously, that the percentage of female researchers in ocean science still varies between 12% in Japan to more than 63% in Croatia. And remember, we have uh, indicated that um, women are more in some countries and are doing much better. We take 10% a high, higher global share uh, than all women in natural sciences. Next slide. We interrogated um, where women are participating, where do we find women? And we found women are actually uh, engaging uh, very proactively and they're talking to the world, they're participating in conferences and it's an indicator uh, of their involvement in ocean science. We had um, up to 53%, uh, depending on the category, uh, of women engaging in conferencing and sharing results of their work, which means that they are doing good work, that they're able to move out uh, into the public domain to share. And this percent, percentage is um, higher in the Global Ocean Science Report 2020 compared to the 2017 report. Next slide. When we look at women empowerment in ocean science, uh, there are challenges and opportunities. We find women are still, uh, or female scientists are still un unrepresented in many categories of ocean science, such as technology, development, and ocean observation. We've seen that uh, SDG 14 requires more women to take part in policy and governance level dialogue. Uh, often we document women's success in higher education, uh, we are able to say we have so many women graduating with masters, PhDs, but usually that does not 
translate into equity in participation in policy and governance frameworks, we find fewer women at higher levels of strategic decision making. And so we call uh, through our report and the results of that report for mainstreaming of gender equity in areas uh, that are critical to ocean science, such as management, conservation, policy and treaty negotiations. We are looking to mainstream gender equity in proposals. We are looking to include gender equity uh, to shift from equity blindness to equity activating policies. We recognize that activities must be culture sensitive because every culture uh, receives um, knowledge uh, from women in different ways and women engage in different ways. So we have to be extremely gender uh, culture sensitive. And most of all, we have to create an enabling framework to make it possible for women to participate equally in ocean science. Next slide. So it's with these thoughts that uh, we come down to our panel of experts and uh, we are asking them uh, two very uh, fundamental questions to this dialogue. And we're asking them whether they can explain uh, three main actions that can be conducted through the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Dis Development that will enable us achieve gender equality for individuals at institutional level and also at the government level. And we are also asking them to identify a few milestones to be achieved by 2025 with respect to women in ocean science. Their reflections will be based on their personal journey. Their reflection will be based on the institutions that they work with. And we look forward to welcoming each one of them to share their thoughts with us. So I'll move to the panelists that have come, um, that are gathered here today. And we are starting with uh, Dr. Anna Gebron. She is the CEO of the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Environment Research, MISTRA. And prior to this, uh, Anna was the Director for Ocean Affairs Department for the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management for almost 10 years. And in her career path, she has moved uh, through being a Director for the Department of Natural Resource Management and Environment and the Swedish Environmental Research Institute. She comes to us also as a member of the Executive Planning Group for the launch of the UN Decade for Ocean Science and Anna holds a PhD in aquatic microbiology. Welcome, Anna, to give us your intervention. Thank you, Jacqueline, and uh, hi, everyone. I will try to uh, keep my six minutes, but uh, I will start to share uh, something of a story of my own. When I started as a PhD student in ocean science almost 30 years ago, we were very few female stu students and almost all professors were men. We had really few female role models and mentors at the time and uh, we really need that guidance, uh, but we really didn't have it. And, and I mean, what we was uh, thinking carefully about was then how could we create such an inspiring uh, environment for us as, as students. And therefore we started a club uh, a club for female marine scientists and experts in Sweden called Havsfruvarna, uh, the Mermaid Club in English. And um, I remember the first meeting that I attended at Cherna Marine Station at that time. I was a bit nervous because I was feeling quite alone as a, a PhD student in my field and, and um, I didn't know the other uh, women and girls participating. But um, at the end of the day, we were all friends and uh, we went for a late night swim and, and dive in the ocean. Some of these women are still part of my professional network and, and personal friends today. During uh, a number of years, we arranged annual meetings where we shared experiences and visited different uh, research institutions and invited inspirational speakers. Over time, things changed, and after some years, the girls outnumbered the boys as undergraduate students, and we opened up for all to participate. However, 
I may say maybe we're too early because today looking at the statistics, the female scientists with higher positions, such as professors, still is only one third of the male professors in our field. With a feminist government and a law against gender discrimination, I consider myself quite lucky. And we have the fundamental policies in place that support equal rights in Sweden. And that is also true for research financing. However, gender equality implies not only equal distrib distribution between men and women in all domains of society, it is also about the qualitative aspects ensuring that the knowledge and experience of both men and women are used to promote progress in all aspects of society. And this also counts for the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. If we want to reach our goals, action at all levels may be needed. And we need to rethink the fundamental basis for how we conduct science and open up for engagement from all parts of the society on a new level. And I think that ocean literacy is a key component in such an endeavor. So to put it simple, to involve women in ocean science for sustainable development, we need to start early with providing education. And that means provide resources for capacity building in the least developed countries. Women need to be invited to the table where the decisions are made. Today, we, men still occupy many of these positions of power in ocean science. So from now on, we must hire people based on competence, not based on sex. We have some really good role models like Sylvia Earle, Maria Damanaki, or Greta Thunberg. And they are important for paving the road for, for women in ocean science. So my sincere hope is that at the end of the decade, a webinar like this focusing on gender equality does not need to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, that was very beautifully put. Um, I'd like to welcome the next uh, presenter. Our next panelist is Mrs. Jean Anisha. Jean is uh, one of Nigeria's most prominent lawyers and a successful author. She has written several volumes of essays in Admiralty, which is a comprehensive collection of essays and learned papers that focus on maritime law. She has a master's in transport management and a law degree. And she comes to us as the president of uh, African Women in Maritime, uh, in Maritime Organization, WIM Africa. And she'll be giving us our intervention. Welcome, Jean. Thank you very much, Chantling. Um, hello, everyone. WIM Africa is excited as I am to be invited to this great event. Uh, women Africa is a huge organization comprised of women in maritime in well over 25 African countries. And I have the privilege to be the president of Women Africa. Now talking about the main actions to be conducted through the UN Decade of Ocean Science for sustainable development to achieve gender equality, we have identified four areas. Now we like to consider individuals. We believe that in increase in general awareness, awareness in ocean literacy and active collaboration with involvement of scientists, mm -hmm. students, policymakers and corporate leaders, as well as mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, maritime specialists, naval leaders, women, youth, local communities, diplomats, and a lot more will contribute to the clean and healthy, resilient, safe, transparent and accessible, productive and sustainable ocean. So this is important for the individuals. And on the institutional aspects, we propose that there should be an open access to the credit facilities for the women in maritime, 
and to contribute to mm -hmm. conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas. And for organizations, we propose that there should be different communities brought together by way of collaboration to develop sustainable ocean needs, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach with all stakeholders, scientists, civil society, gender inclusion and other vulnerable communities. Now this we believe will result with the results of ocean scientific ocean research will engage engaging women in maritime will assist in achieving gender equality in ocean science. And the fourth um, department, the fourth region that we're considering is the government. We propose a capacity building through scholarships on the ocean sciences for African women is apt. I heard earlier when uh, Jacqueline was introducing um, the topic and she mentioned that under the SDG 14, we don't have enough women who have been uh, privileged to go through courses on ocean science and even to get up to the master and PhD degree level. This is true. So it's important therefore that our government um, introduce scholarships for training and capacity building of women in this regard. And of course, again, I'd like to reiterate that there's need for collaboration, for sharing scientific data and information. These are the four main actions that we have identified, mm -hmm. which we believe that if conducted through the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science, would sustain the development that will achieve gender equality. And then talking about um, the milestones or targets for 2025, uh, which Women Africa has identified, identified that implementation is key, implementation of scientific based management plans to restore fish populations in the shortest possible time and the mechanism to reduce the IUU fishing. This is one target. And our second target is the open access and joint collaboration for sharing data and information of ocean science research with local communities and other stakeholders. This is very important. Um, it's important that it's all an inclusive uh, system. It's important that local communities are also uh, taken into consideration when the collaboration is being considered. On inclusion, we also propose that inclusion of the more African women in programs, projects and activities of the ocean science decade will be um, really appreciated, such as what we're doing today. We appreciate the fact that uh, the UN and its um, uh, support team has deemed it necessary to involve WIM Africa in this webinar meeting. We also propose empowerment of women in maritime through scholarship on ocean sciences for African women. I said that earlier, and it's important that the training by scholarships is very important to ensuring that these women um, attain necessary educational qualifications up to the PhD level. Furthermore, is the establishment of education and training institutions in Africa to build capacity of the women on blue economy. In WIM Africa, training is very key. Some of our members are members of the World Aquaculture Society and some are actually even in the board of the World Aquaculture Society. And so we train some of our women on fish farming and fish processing. So the establishment of training institutions as we have in Togo, if we have that in other African countries, that will actually build capacity of the women on blue economy. Finally is the implementation of marine spatial planning and limitation of the marine protected areas for the sustainable use of the oceans in Africa. So these are the targets that we have identified as our milestones for 2025. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jean, for that. Uh, very exciting insights and uh, very thought-provoking insights. I'd like to welcome the next panelist, who is Ms. Mara Frelich. Mara is a doctoral candidate at um, MIT, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and she's also the treasurer for the Society of Women in Marine Science. She, she has studied uh, physical oceanographic processes related to ocean ecosystems, carbon cycling and nutrient distributions. And her research on climate modeling includes critical future looking work on the role of climate models in shaping climate policy at the local to international levels. Mara will be sharing her journey uh, and some insights as a member of the Society for Women in Marine Sciences. Welcome, Mara. Thank you. And thank you very much to the organizers and the other panelists as well. That's a, where we're coming from, the Society for Women in Science, or SWIMS, as we call it, is we see some of the main challenges for women in ocean science as discrimination in access to institutional resources and leadership, and also mm -hmm. social and solution. And this leads to the devaluation of women's contributions compared to those of our male counterparts. And these issues compound over time. And so they really need to be addressed in early career stages. And this is where SWIMS, um, where we do our work mm -hmm. in SWIMS, I'm um, in the intervention that I'll be making today. And so to make change beginning at the individual level, we really think individuals within the scientific community should identify their personal stake in gender equity. And then based on their personal stake, align time, peer relationships and actions accordingly. And this is important for both men and women to do. Um, and for many SWIMS members, our experience with gender-based marginalization within marine science motivate our involvement in SWIMS. But, personal experiences alone are not enough to effectively work for change. We also have to develop a sense of solidarity. So not just advocating for ourselves and our immediate circles, also with others, including those who don't have exactly the same experiences as us because of other identities like race, class, disability, not gender. This gender equity also go well beyond our careers and our motivation arises from the gender issues that underlie environmental issues like climate change and plastic pollution. And so SWIMS is really unique in my experience because it's an institution where women and especially early career women are in positions of power. And that means that early career women are also setting the norms of conduct. One of our main programs in SWIMS is regional symposia and on the slide here, you're seeing part of one of our symposia planning committees. And the symposia are places where marine scientists and especially women and non-binary scientists can gain visibility, networks, and collaboration. And throughout all of the SWIMS work, members gain really valuable leadership experience. Scientific contributions, um, science communication, and also interpersonal and community efforts are really readily valued and celebrated in swim spaces. And our symposia are completely different from any other scientific meeting I have been to, not only because of the gender balance of the attendees, but also because the symposia bring conversations about gender and other discrimination into professional spaces. And that really allows us to enter scientific spaces, um, the whole people and bring our stories and experiences with us to contribute. And so SWIMS recently became a nonprofit and we became a nonprofit because we were growing rapidly with 20 chapters in the US and two abroad. And we really needed more institutional support to sustain this network. So we're really grateful to operate within an ecosystem of other nonprofits and organizations doing aligned work. But we found that mainstream science institutions didn't see the issues that SWIMS works on as part of their work. Um, and so we needed additional support. We think that science institution, institutions should change that view of their missions and really make space for equal voices of women, especially in leadership and decision making. And in doing so, maintain a critical eye towards race and nationality in addition to gender. And so what we're saying here for in changes that institutions should be making is to see gender equity as really essential to see, achieving any scientific mission. 
And relatedly, at the governmental level, you see that government should increase transparency of science funding opportunities to make access more equitable for early career scientists in general and women in particular. Access to funding um, will really allow our networks to thrive. And funding should also be prioritized to organizations and people who are investing in the future of science by creating safe and inclusive training environments. And finally, science doesn't operate within a vacuum and inequity outside of science affects the scientific community. This means institutional decisions about funding and hiring should be attentive to social conditions that exist um, that perpetuate marginalization. For example, by placing more housework on women, and this has become especially prevalent during the pandemic, limiting educational opportunities. And this is true even as we, as scientists um, and outside of the scientific domain, work to change reality of discrimina discrimination, marginalization for women um, and others more broadly. And so in summary, by 2025, the middle of the decade, we would like to see gender parity in academic science. But beyond that, increased levels of women in science leadership, an orientation of institutional priorities towards equity, strong protections against sexual harassment, and a cultural shift towards ready recognition of scientific contributions, regardless of the gender of the investigators. Thank you very, very much, Mara, uh, for those very, very deep insights and congratulations for the work you're doing at SWINS. We welcome Dr. Genevieve Bouchard, uh, Hydrographer General of Canada. Um, Genevieve comes to us um, having done a lot in her career. Uh, she has uh, held several senior executive positions within the Government of Canada in science departments, for instance, at the Centre of Remote Sensing, at the Geological Survey of Canada and at the Metrological Service of Canada. She holds a PhD in environmental microbiology and started her career in research and development applied to mining. Welcome, Genevieve. Thank you, um, Jacqueline, and thank you to the organizers for having me today to be part of this event. Um, with the launch of UN Decade, I've in only a few months away, I think the timing is right for us to discuss what we think we can and must collectively do over the next decade. And um, I first spoke publicly about uh, the importance of empowering women 18 months ago at a conference organized by the World Maritime University. It was also the first time in my career that I attended a completely sold out conference. Um, and at that conference, I heard firsthand the importance of sharing experiences, of having a network, both men and women, and the power of role models. And at that time, I was trying to understand why we did not have enough women in the executive cadre of my organization, the Canadian Hydrographic Service. Um, now, the Canadian Hydrographic Service um, is responsible for charting Canadian waters. So our staff, our employees uh, do field work, they go out on on, on ships, they collect data, they process data, and they produce nautical publications. And yet, you know, we have very talented women in the field of hydrography and in, in our organization. And so I was asking myself, were they not interested in senior positions or were they not being exposed or getting the experiences they needed to successfully compete for these positions? So a, a month later, um, shortly after the conference, I asked, Annie Biron, who is one of our senior hydrographers, to launch a women's network and start looking at how we can answer some of those questions. And um, recognizing that both men and women need to be part of the solution, uh, she started with the women. Uh, she created a safe space for them to come forward and identify issues and barriers that they were seeing. And I realized that these went, went way beyond uh, just competing for senior positions. They identified several issues and provided some concrete recommendations uh, to me and to the executives of the organization. And these have now been shared with the whole organization. And the next step for us will be to involve everyone as we implement solutions. And I wanted to share this because 
when we looked at the challenges that they identified, they ended up, there were enough of them that they ended up uh, organizing them by themes. And I felt that although this was identified in my organization, some of these themes will resonate with others in other organizations. Um, so the first theme was work-life balance. So for example, um, there was not enough, there's not enough notice given for field deployments at times. So women mm -hmm. may not be, may be disadvantaged when they're planning. Um, health hygiene and safety was another theme, making sure that every everyone in the organization has uh, protective gear that fits uh, and understanding that folks have different shapes. Uh, harassment prevention and empowering employees to speak up when unacceptable behavior is observed. Respect and values was a fourth theme. Equal opportunity was a fifth theme. And finally, career development is ensuring that we support uh, women, providing them with specialized training, et cetera. And um, this, uh, these challenges, um, I think are, are probably universal. And what's important is what can we do about them? And what, what are some of the concrete actions that we can take? Uh, so if we look at my slides, these are pulled from the recommendations and from the ideas that came from this group. Um, there's need for us to collectively take action individually. Uh, we need to question, we need to ask, we need to show interest, uh, we need to listen, we need to learn to trust. Um, and uh, we need to speak up, as I mentioned, when we witness inappropriate behaviors. If we move on to the next slide, um, from an organizational perspective, um, we need to provide a space for women to come forward and express uh, issues. And um, we need to involve everyone in finding and implementing solutions. And interestingly enough, I mean, I think our organization has a positive culture and, and folks enjoy working at CHS, yet when we created a safe space, we did identify issues. So um, just want to encourage other organizations to consider how you can bring that voice forward to be able to really make a difference. Uh, if we move on to the next slide where we were asked about what governments might do, um, the um, certainly want to emphasize the outreach and recruitment program. We need to get more girls in STEM, uh, but we also need to be able to promote female role models for those girls. And uh, finally, we need to make, put in place um, uh, opportunities to enable them to understand governance, participate in governance, so that they aspire to uh, decision-making roles. And if we go to the last slide, um, what I believe we can do in the next 10 years and what we should really aspire to over the decade is to increase the number of women at higher echelons in decision-making roles, in addition to uh, increasing the number of young women in STEM, which is the feeder group for the decision makers of tomorrow. Um, I believe that we can share our experiences, we can help build networks, and we can provide role models to facilitate all of this. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Genevieve. Uh, for those wonderful uh, thoughts and a very clear way forward. I'd like to welcome Professor Rohan Long as our next speaker. And uh, Rohan is the director of the World Maritime uh, University. He comes to us uh, having had a lot of experience uh, in ocean governance issues, and he leads a team of specialists that are undertaking uh, projects on land to ocean leadership, climate change, law of the sea, and areas beyond national uh, jurisdiction. I'd like to welcome him to give us his thoughts on this issue. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ugu. And it's, uh, it's a great privilege to join this important uh, webinar this afternoon in Europe. I'd also like to say congratulations to you personally as well as IOC and indeed the chair of IOC for making this a priority issue for the decade. Uh, first slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, on the first slide, sorry, can you, can you go back to my cover slide? Yeah, on the uh, slide, it's a picture of the World uh, Maritime University and uh, our distinguished uh, previous speaker, Dr. Beshard, made reference to our uh, conference on uh, empowerment of women in the maritime community. Uh, we're a capacity development university within the United Nations system and we're based in uh, Sweden. And I'm going to speak specifically about an empowering women for the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science, which is underway at the university. Now, first slide. I did two strands to the research and I would emphasize it's both a, a research and a capacity building program. Now, the first strand looks at the role of gender equality and the empowerment of women in ocean science bodies. And we have case studies in ISIS, IOC, mm -hmm. UNESCO, as well as scientific and educational institutions in Kenya. Mm -hmm. The second strand is to look at gender equality in regulatory and ocean science governance systems that coordinate, manage and mediate ocean science. And in this instance, we have uh, case studies in, in, in relation to the International Seabed Authority, FAO, the, the Division on Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, IUCN and the High Seas Alliance, which is an alliance of over 40 NGOs working on the BBNJ agreement, as well as institutions under the Nairobi Convention. And the purpose of the program, which is funded by Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, is to produce a strategy and action plan and to make practical and policy relevant recommendations uh, for improving gender equality in ocean science and science dependent governance systems. Next slide. Um, so what are the main actions to achieve gender equality? And this is the, the views of our team in Malmo. Uh, firstly, we must all ensure that gender equality is a central pillar of all decade activities. In relation to individual actions, advocacy and awareness raising is a personal mission uh, for all of us in, in Malmo and likewise for everybody that is participating in the decade particularly in relation to supporting pathways to empower women and to remove barriers to gender equality. Secondly, on institutional actions, and I would like to highlight this because you raised it, Madam Moderator, yourself in your opening intervention, which is this critical issue of data. Uh, we mm -hmm. must uh, collect uh, data in relation to the gender profile of institutions and indeed uh, both public and private institutions. Uh, secondly, we must implement gender responsive policies. And thirdly, we must focus on measurable outcomes, including reconciling work with family life, regardless of gender. Uh, thirdly, on the issue of government actions, and we've been very active on this space, and uh, we would like to see gender equality provisions in international instruments, such as the uh, BBNJ agreement, which is under negotiation at the United Nations, as well as at the CBD uh, strategic plan for biodiversity for 2021 to 2030. And again, I would pick up uh, on a point made by the previous uh, speaker. We must ensure effective women representation in decision-making bodies and senior leadership positions, uh, particularly in relation to uh, public and private uh, science bodies. Next slide. Okay, what are the milestones to be achieved by 2025? And we discussed this amongst our agenda group in Malmo, and in particularly in relation to actions by uh, institutions and government. Firstly, it has to be based on data. That is to say, we need an empirical science base uh, to set general objectives and specific targets in relation to gender equality. Uh, thirdly, we must promote openness and transparency and responsibility. I think that's a common theme across the uh, discussions so far this afternoon. Uh, fourthly, we must ensure all decision making and management actions are informed by gender equality objectives. And thereafter, we must monitor and evaluate performance on the attainment of a specific equality targets. Uh, by 2025, our group in Malmo would like to see and the reporting on these objectives. Secondly, a, a reassessment and then a, a reaction 
or indeed a recalibration of those objectives in light of the performance on the targets. And finally, there's a, a very brief note there at the bottom of the slide, gender equality is never an isolated issue. It must permeate all activities throughout the decade. Uh, next slide. So what are we doing about it at the Global Ocean Institute? Uh, firstly, we are producing a report on institutional opportunities and challenges for empowering women scientists for the decade. Uh, secondly, uh, we're working with a range of intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations. Uh, thirdly, we're involved in advocacy and uh, very important international processes uh, such as the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction negotiations. And you can see a slide of a mm -hmm. keynote uh, delivered by the president of the university who is a great gender activist at the third session of the BBNJ negotiation. And that's to raise awareness and to ensure that we have uh, very specific provisions in the new agreement in relation to gender. And of course, we're going to produce our strategy and action plan. And uh, next slide. So I'd like to, um, to conclude by acknowledging our wonderful team led by the president of the university, as well as Susan uh, Jensen, Momoko, Francis, Clive, Elnis, Jill, Rennes, uh, Ellen and Marie Amalia. And uh, thank you very much as well to Fisheries and Oceans Canada. We're just at the start of our mission on gender equality and we're going to be very interested in tracking progress over the next 10 years. Uh, back to you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very, very much uh, for that interesting uh, insight. We come to our last speaker. And I'd like to remind uh, all participants to put, type in their questions in the Q&A, indicate your name and uh, also uh, who you'd like to respond to your question. As we do that, I'll welcome uh, Dr. Sachana Apple. Uh, Sachana comes to us uh, all the way from Thailand and she has a broad base of ecological research interests that uh, involve the study of nearshore species from tropical to polar regions. And what uh, you may not know is that she's the first uh, female from Thailand, female scientist to go diving in Antarctica and the Arctic. So I welcome uh, Sachana to give us her insight into this exciting topic. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank IOC for allowing me to join this event uh, and I'm very honored for this. Well, uh, many people have always asked me why I become a marine scientist, why I choose marine biology as my major when I was a university student. And I have to tell you that the reason why many Thai people asking me like this because marine science major is not a popular subject amongst the women in Thailand. And I have to say that in Thailand, working and doing a research related to the ocean, particular having to work in the field, women still are not preferred. And this may be because of the physical or body strength. How about now? Personally, I think right now is much better than uh, before. Uh, the opportunities uh, for women in science are much better than, than before. And this may be because the women have already proved to the society that they can do well in marine science area. In the past, it was a man world, but right now it's not anymore. Women are proven that even though their physical strength may not strong equal to men, but they as a woman can do a job nicely using other advantages that they have. For example, women tend to consider in detail things that is very important for study in ocean science. And this is an example. I have to admit that right now, marine science field in Thailand is still a largely male dominated field. And a lot of time when I sit in a committees for meetings, I found out that um, I, I was the only female in the meeting. And sometimes I feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable but well, my strategy is not let it get to you, do the best and show that women can do it. And not only that, 
seniority is also an issue. If you are women plus young, then you face double challenges. But what we can do to overcome those challenges during the decades? Uh, next slide, please. In the past 10 years, I think I'm very lucky that I have an opportunity to involve with the IOC Westpath. And I think so far IOC Westpath doing quite excellent job in encouraging more women um, to involve uh, in the projects under the IOC. However, allowing them to involve or making ocean side knowledge accessible may not be enough. By recognizing their work, which is very important, can be a key change or milestone in more empowering women in ocean science and can build a new cultures of science. Next slide, please. Today, women in marine science still face the challenges specific to their gender that also sometimes related to their cultures. Young women lack of confidence and they need a role models to provide positive reinforce and to reassure that this career, women can do it and can mix with their family responsibilities. Next, please. As for the actions, I think IOC or other institutions or organization can do by finding more marine science role model for young women to follow or to seek support or encouragement. Institution organization could also provide more hand-on experience to young women to let them involve more in the marine science, both in the field work and also in the laboratory. Participation, especially at the early stage, I believe that it is a key to success in marine science career and can increase more women in science. These are the examples of what institutions or organizations can do. Last but not least, I would like to say that, uh, say to individual young uh, women that positive attitude is very important. Once we decide that we will go to marine science career road, we have to go after it. The road to marine science research career is long and demands. Trust person who choose this path must also have to believe in herself and believe in her ability to do it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that inspiration. Um, we now come to question and answer, and I can see some questions uh, coming up. Uh, though they are not um, targeted uh, to everyone, to particular people, I can start with one that I have seen that is quite interesting. It comes to us from Sam Dupont, University of Gothenburg. And he asks uh, our panelists, uh, to just give us a reflection on the best way to handle resistance of some institutions to fully respond to some of the issues we've highlighted here. Often, uh, and I think all the women uh, in this uh, session have experienced uh, issues being minimized to keep um, institutions safe because it's easy to be safe and to avoid public embarrassment. What would we have a word towards that? It's not an easy question, but I think uh, our panelists, maybe Genevieve, could give us a thought. Thank you for that question. It's an excellent one. And I think it's a matter of culture. I think the times today are different than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, I think we need to, uh, and sometimes organizations don't take action because they're not quite sure what to do or because the processes to address uh, specific issues, if it's a harassment, for example, are, are onerous and, and difficult. And so I think um, what we need to see is uh, an acceptance that we need to listen, create space for folks to come forward, build trust and, um, and have actions and culture involve everyone. 
So management has a responsibility and what we did with what's happening at uh, in our organization is the executives made a commitment to, um, to including everyone and to uh, following through on recommendations. But I think p- part of it is, is culture and how do we change that? And it's by having everyone involved. I don't know if that helps uh, answer the question. Uh, thank you, Genevieve. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, from uh, Professor Sarah Sek. Uh, she's from Dalhouse in Canada. And uh, I'll focus it to Rohan. And uh, the question is whether there is need to better value the insights of women with non-STEM backgrounds when it comes to determining who is deserving of holding decision-making positions of authority in ocean science governance. Uh, in her opinion, it's a problem uh, in, non- in non-ocean context as well. Maybe Rohan can give a go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. absolutely. And I, I, I think, you know, we, we've cited this uh, afternoon some very important uh, mentors and leaders within the uh, ocean science community. And I think that's, that's crucially important. I'm very fortunate in the sense that I work for a very dynamic leader at the World Maritime University. And uh, I think the first key aspect of this is that it has to permit uh, all actions and decision making within the work environment. And uh, I think that's that's quite crucial because essentially there are so many impediments and barriers, uh, particularly in relation to uh, uh, families and other barriers, which I've experienced myself. uh, And indeed, uh, I see with colleagues that impede them from advancement. So it's it's about the systemic changes that we can make to organization to, to, to uh, respond to excellence and respond to value. And then of course, to take the distinctive nature of those barriers, uh, which are gender-based into consideration in your decision-making, particularly in relation firstly to recruitment, uh, secondly to advancement, and thirdly, in relation to promotions and opportunities. So I, I, I think it's right across the spectrum. And uh, I, I think that's come across in all the uh, interventions this afternoon. So Dr. Ruku, thank you for the question. Um, I have one here. Uh, for all who have posed questions, we may not be able to answer everything, but we will be sending questions out and getting individual responses from panelists. That could, be, that could come back to you. But we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and this attendee is asking, how do we prevent the leaky pipeline, which is losing uh, highly qualified scientists as they are unable to move further in their uh, co- academic career due to factors such as family planning, uh, culture within organizations? How do we deal with that? Uh, would anyone have a strategy or have had to deal with this? Maybe from my panelists that can deal with this question. Start um, as a, one of the early career participants and looking forward, what, what do people within our network want mm-hmm. to see in terms of support? So one of them is making sure that our contributions are being valued equally. Um, so that there are opportunities for hiring, um, opportunities for promotion. And one of those is that um, unfortunately women, and this is true at least in the US for people of color are in academic careers are asked to do additional work um, to change the culture of the organizations. But that additional work often isn't valued as a main part of the job and it's often not considered in hiring, not considered in promotion. Um, And so making sure that those contributions are being valued in a formal way can help um, relieve some of what may be seen as an extra burden on women and turn that around to celebrating the unique contributions that people are bringing to organizations. And so that's one and the other has to do with we're, what we do is try to create networks of women and we include men in those networks, we include everyone in those networks, but we want to create these um, larger scientific networks. Um, and we know that a lot of hiring does happen through networks and through visibility. And so making sure that you're looking beyond your own um, network um, to these other um, 
networks that exist um, with really valuable contributions. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mara. Uh, I have one here for Anna. Oh, Anna, welcome. You can contribute to that, then I'll ask you the follow on question. So I was just thinking as a, a financer of research, uh, one way to really handle this sort of leakage that takes place is to, to uh, provide programs over a long time, making it possible to actually have these changes in life taking place. I mean, you have a family and, and uh, both male and females have times off uh, with children. So if you invest over time a, a research program, then you can prevent some of this leakage. So that's mm -hmm. one possibility. Thanks. Um, so Anna, again, um, someone, an anonymous, anonymous attendee has indicated that uh, uh, applications should be made anonymous um, to ensure that um, people are not looking at gender but also women with foreign sounding names are regularly discriminated against. And uh, maybe you could reflect on that coming from a very diverse uh, country that has embraced and mainstreamed diverse nationalities, Anna. I think it's a great idea. And, and actually we have tried it uh, when I was working at the agency for Swedish uh, water management and ocean management. We uh, sometimes we, when we applied for new employees, we just removed the names. And I think it's a, it's a great idea because then you, you tend to look at what's in the application and not uh, sort of discriminate against sexes or origin or something. So I think it's a great idea and it should be tried much more. Thank you. I have a question or oh, Rohan, you'd like to contribute? Yeah, it's just something we've learned in our institute as a result of the, um, the Canadian uh, funded program is, you know, it has to start at home. So as part of our program, we have a, a gender awareness training. And, uh, you know, it's not something I received in my own education, but I think it should really be a, a mandatory for anybody that's involved in, a, in decision making or indeed who is participating in scientific research in any capacity. So there is a there's a big knowledge gap about the importance of this. So uh, mandatory gender uh, uh, training as part of your, um, shall we say, lifelong education, uh, particularly for those of us of, of a certain generation. And I, I think much younger people are probably far more uh, gender aware than uh, perhaps people of my generation. But that's, of course, open to debate. So thank you. Okay. I have, I'm taking the last one and uh, maybe Sachana will uh, speak into that. We have a young lady, Nancy Riba from Tanzania. And she says, ocean science is not popular in my country. And she struggled uh, to start her own ocean literacy initiatives to tackle misconceptions in ocean science. She interacts with young women pursuing uh, ocean science. But uh, she's just looking for some ideas on how she can increase practical opportunities for girls in science, especially in countries where it's not popular. So maybe Shatrana and Jean could give some input into that and then we'll begin to close. Okay, um, thank you very much for the questions. And actually uh, right now I'm doing a lot of outreach and I totally understand the situation, what, what she raised. And uh, one thing that, um, is my trick to do is that well those young kids um it's, it's very good to let them you know have a hand-on experience but one thing that we have to remember that um they they like to listen the story not the theory a lot of time mm -hmm. you know we, we talk a lot of the theory but actually it's hard to remember so if uh, we would like to really you know impress them uh try to reach them as much as possible so uh, tell them the story instead of the theory and that's why mm -hmm. right now um, science communication is come to play an important role on that and um, so I'll tell you the truth um, I think it's also important as a scientist to learn you know to become a science communicator too mm -hmm. a lot of time people thought that you know can be others uh, 
that is not don't have background on, uh, on science could become a science communicator. But in the reality, as a scientist, we all already have all the knowledge, but we can just, you know, somehow have to uh, teach ourselves, try to communicate and to reach out the public. Yeah. Very nice, thank you. Maybe Jean, you could give one, one comment into that? With yes, from experience. Jacqueline, forgive me. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And like the last speaker said, you need to have knowledge in ocean sciences. Uh, the knowledge is very key before you can impart um, any form of knowledge on your society or those who are equally interested. However, um, I'm happy to note that one of our best uh, members in ocean sciences, Madam Francesca Delgado from Angola, is mm -hmm. one of the participants. So we're going to. Uh, contact you and um, tell you how to go about it. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. We still have many questions streaming in. I would like to encourage you to keep on streaming them um, because they give us food for thought as we plan for the decade. At this point, I would like to welcome Kirsten to give us some thoughts on uh, the ocean decade and some highlights on what to expect and how to engage. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you and to actually have that pleasure to close this session. Um, it has been incredibly um, yeah, inspiring what I heard today, and I'm happy that we really heard different voices and also um, male voices, because I think it's, uh, it's important that we uh, do that together. And this was highlighted every individual can contribute to really strive for gender equity because I think that is what we want. We want equal possibilities for women and men. And this is also important for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development because only if we have all the um, human capacity involved, I think we will also be able to uh, achieve the the vision of the uh, decade of ocean science for sustainable development, the science we need for the ocean we want, while um, putting our transformative ocean, transformative ocean science solution for sustainable development, connecting people and our ocean, and all people, including women. Next slide, please. The decade. Uh, the, the decade um, highlights seven societal outcomes, and I'm just um, trying to highlight here this, the last one. We need an inspiring and engaging ocean where society understands and values the ocean in relation to human well-being and sustainable, sustainable development. And it's also the other way around. It's also the ocean science who should value all humans. And I think it's important that going from this event here, not only, of course, from this event, but um, to understand that gender equality needs to be mainstream in all uh, decade activities, that it's one of the criteria to actually become endorsed as a decade activity. And, and there, I directly go to my next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, because the first call of uh, decade Actions is just out. It was uh, published on the 15th of October and goes until the 15th of January in 2021, um, where we now call for global or major regional programs or contributions, including support to central or decentralized coordination functions of the program. There's right now no uh, geographic or thematic restriction. So we could, of course, as well think of how can we pull out um, a decade program? Do we want to go somewhere or in which decade programs do we have to uh, really pull it, put an eye on to uh, include gender equality, gender equity more, more general? And one of the criteria for endorsement to actually become one of this decade action is um, to overcome barriers to uh, diver di diversity and equity, including gender, uh, gen 
generational and geographic diversity. So only if that is um, reassured, <coughs> we will. This will be a um, agenda, a, a decade program. I'm sorry. Um, there were already two uh, Q and A live sessions for applicants and. Um, more information is on the Decade website. Thank you very much, Kirsty. I'm sorry. I'm just, uh, yeah. Sorry, okay. just one more slide. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I had a little. Um, sorry for that. Oh, no, no. So we, it's now the time to act as well for those uh, Decade programs that we all keep an eye on that gender equality as well represented that we go now with action from this webinar to the next year when the decade starts. Um, there will be several events um, and just to highlight two, on the 11th of February, there's a Women and the Girls Science Day where we will definitely highlight the decade and gender equality again. And then of course, the 8th of March, where we will try to highlight again the importance of women in ocean science, the importance of having women really at all tables and how we hopefully can foster that in the future. So here I finish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I, we now come towards the close of this um, very, very exciting session. I wish we could uh, answer all your questions. I can see there are 40 questions. Uh, coming up, uh, they'll be shared with the panelists and we will interrogate them. We hope to have a report out uh, from these sessions, but I'd just like to highlight what we've heard or what I've picked uh, and learned from each of my panelists and from each of you who have asked questions. I think what the first thing uh, is that role models are important and it's not just men and women, uh, men, uh, women. Role models should include men. Um, and it's important that the men should not be left behind in this uh, dialogue. So we're very excited that Rohan was able to join us uh, to be a representative uh, of uh, that gender because it's important and I believe that very strongly. Uh, the other thing I've picked is that women uh, have to come together to make a difference. Uh, we cannot stand alone, uh, we have to come together but I also think that it starts with an individual. I think on my word check, individuals stood out quite, um, quite a bit. Almost every other speaker mentioned the word individual. And so that means that it starts with me, myself. Uh, I have to trust myself. We have to trust ourselves. We should trust ourselves to say and have our voices heard. And we have to trust ourselves to be part of the journey and part of that change. It is true that uh, women have many issues uh, and sometimes we overlook them, such as getting the right gear to go to the field. Uh, th things don't fit right. And so you end up having to struggle with things that don't fit right. Uh, notice uh, comes very late. You're told today and tomorrow you have to be on a boat uh, to go out and get your samples. And we recognize we are, we are scientists, we are career women, but we are also mothers, sisters, and caregivers. And so there's a lot uh, that comes um, packaged uh, in uh, as women that we bring uh, to that table. And I think all those roles help us bring uh, many experiences and a lot of wisdom to that table. If only we could find a space on it, and if only we could be invited to share those voices. I picked also the fact that it's important to have gender disaggregated uh, data, gender disaggregated data in what we are doing. It's important to embed women in proposals so that we get involved. Let's not leave each other behind. And um, I think the last uh, point, the last few points uh, come from um, Thailand uh, where Sachana uh, asked, um, that people asked her why she chose a career in the sea. And uh, when I reflected on that, indeed it's a hard journey, it's not an easy journey. But in my case, I always say the sea chose me uh, to, 
to speak for it. And so I believe as women that he has chosen us because we will understand it, we will pick um, its voice and we will share what the sea has to say. So let's not stop uh, listening to the sea because when you listen, you'll be able to see and you'll be able to talk about it. And finally, let's tell the story. Let's put aside the theory. Uh, let's begin to tell an interesting story about the sea because I think when people hear the story, then they will go to the theory and then they will take up the science and then they will do something interesting. Uh, this is a journey, uh, I believe, that uh, should encompass everyone. And I know on the Q&A uh, and on the chat box, we had many political scientists asking, uh, how do we get involved? It, we seem to have closed it to natural scientists. So uh, I just want to emphasize that it's a journey for each one of us. It's an interesting journey. And I look forward to the UN decade uh, for ocean science, making it real for all of us uh, up to the grassroots. So I'd like to thank each one of my panelists. Uh, you were wonderful. I've learned a great deal. I wish we could engage further into the night. Uh, it's getting dark where I am uh, with a few more stories, but we leave that for another day. So thank you. Thank you, participants. We look forward to probably hosting you yet again for a more in-depth discussion. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Jacqueline. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.